All right, so we move on to uh, gastrointestinal disorders. What I mean by gastrointestinal disorders are conditions that affect the gastrointestinal system, which are surgically related. So our first topic will be cancrum oris. Cancrum oris. All right, so let's look at what cancrum oris is. Cancrum oris, also known as noma, from the Greek word to devour or to destroy, is a devastating infectious disease which destroys the soft and hard tissues of the oral and paraoral structures. So they destroy the soft tissues of the hard and soft tissues of the mouth. And then the paraoral structures are structures that are around the mouth, like the lips, the cheeks. The dehumanizing orofacial gangrenous lesion affects predominantly children who are aged two to five years, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, I used to say, or I've been saying that, all the bad, bad conditions are mostly related to the poorer countries, Africa. And when you come to Africa, the poorest of the poorest are those of us in the sub-Saharan Africa. So cancrum oris is much more predominant in sub-Saharan Africa among children. So you can see the picture here demonstrating um, a form of cancrum oris which is just starting from one side of the mat. Okay, so you can see a more severe form of cancrum oris, how far it has gotten to. Etiology. When we say etiology, what we refer to or what we mean is the causative factors or causes, simply put. So etiology. The cause of cancrum oris is unknown, but several factors are thought to be precipitators, or we have several factors that are believed to be leading to cancrum oris. Let's look at some of these precipitating factors or predisposing factors. Poverty is one of them, malnutrition particularly, people who lack vitamins A and B, or children who lack vitamins A and B, or dehydration, poor hygiene, particularly poor oral hygiene, people who drink unsafe water. All these factors are predisposing factors. Others include proximity to unkempt livestock, infectious diseases such as measles, an immunodeficiency disease. Another and one example is HIV AIDS. Now, all these factors are thought to be predisposing factors to cancrum oris. Okay, so when somebody develops this condition called cancrum oris, what are some of the signs and symptoms? We call it clinical manifestations that you will see to want to believe that the client is likely suffering from cancrum oris. Okay, so let's look at the acute stage of this condition. The lesion starts inside the mat in association with acute ulcerative gingivitis. And this spreads to the lips and the cheeks. What I'm saying here is, the lesion, the lesion, lesion means the wound or the sore, mostly starts within the mat and it becomes ulcerative. Ulcerative means that it becomes a big wound and can cause gingivitis, gingivitis inflammation of the gum, gingivi. So the gum also becomes inflamed and then it becomes uh, gangrenous or ulcerative. And all these will then spread to the cheek. 
and that is what will make you see the first picture that we saw so it has started from the mouth and then it has now spread to the lip it has just begun but as time goes on it will eat up and destroy the tissues to make the individual appear this worse now the earlier stage which is seldom seen is a painful red or purplish red spot on the alveolar margin most often in his premolar or molar region. So your anatomy and physiology might have taught you the structures of the mat. Now, what we are saying is, uh, the condition mostly starts with a lesion. Sometimes this is not seen from the beginning. You won't even notice it. And later on, this lesion or sore becomes kind of painful and these will spread to the alveolar. The alveolar is the part where the teeth are inserted into, just above the teeth. So it's spread to that side and then it can also continue until the premolar and the molar regions where the teeth behind, that is in the cheeks, are inserted into it can spread to all of that areas this lesion rapidly forms an ulcer which exposes the underlying alveolar bone so the lesion which is the solid um, structure that developed continue and then if it, 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 it Officially, not, not officially, but it becomes, it fully becomes a sore or an ulcer. And this can eat and eat the tissues until it exposes the alveolar bone. Typical signs at this stage includes sore mat. So your mat becomes sore, very painful. There is a swelling, tender and painful lip or cheek. There is profuse salivation and there is extremely foul smell with purulent discharge from the mouth or nose. So these are some of the typical signs that you are likely to see during this period of time. Let's look at the chronic stage. Within the next two to three days, a bluish black area of discoloration appears externally on the lips or cheek like the first picture we saw. The gangrenous area is cone-shaped so that much more tissue is destroyed inside, inside the mouth than the external wound might indicate. What I'm trying to say here is, if you still remember what a cone, how a cone is, you will see that the base of the cone is broader and then the apex of the cone uh, becomes smaller or it becomes smaller as it gets to the apex. So the cancrum oris lesion or ulceration looks like a cone. Inside is the base of the cone and then outside is the, the, the apex of the cone. So mostly a lot of, you will be seeing just a very small from the beginning lesion or so outside and you'll be thinking the wound is that small. No, when you get inside, the, the wound is much more bigger or destructive in there. After separation of the slough, his exposed bone and teeth rapidly sequestrate. So what we're trying to say is, when the tissues that are destroyed, the wound, that the destroyed tissue, that's what we refer to as the slough or the dead tissue. When you remove these sloughs uh, and the bones get exposed, the alveolar bone get exposed, they rapidly sequestrate. Sequestrate is death of bone. Diagnostic investigations. What are the things we will do to be able to confirm that um, the condition we are seeing is cancrum oris and not any other condition? The first diagnostic investigation will be your history and physical examination. So I have been saying this is the cheapest Diagnostic investigation you can always write. 
and this runs through in all conditions. Whenever you are asked what are the diagnostic investigations you will conduct, uh, don't think far, just talk about the, the history that the client will present. And then the physical examination, when you look at the client, what are the things you, will, you see? So these things goes a very long way to give you a clue to what condition he or she is presenting. And this one runs through in all conditions. The second diagnostic investigation will be swaps and culture for organisms. So we want to do a swab. We want to take a swab at the site where the ulcer is. Take it to the lab and then they will do culture. The culture will identify the organism and then uh, we can also do sensitivity to, to be able to test to see antibiotics that organisms are responsive to. So what we are saying is organisms that are commonly isolated in this condition are Borrelia vicenti and then Fusiform bacilli. Others are anaerobes in rapidly progressing cases. We can also do facial x-rays and CT scan to determine the extent of the involvement or the extent of destruction of tissues management. So once we have been able to ascertain that the condition we are looking at is cancrum oris, what do we do? We want to help this client to regain his health. During the acute stage of cancrum oris, you start emergency treatment immediately and you aim to build up the uh, child's general resistance. So you want to build the child's immunity. If possible, you admit the child. There is no need to isolate him. If admission is impractical, you can also do outpatient treatment. You want to correct anemia, that is if the child is anemic. So you give him hematinics. That will help to boosting his red blood cells production by folic acid, ions, ascorbic acid, and then some vitamin B complexes, particularly the cotinic acid. We also want to give this child antibiotics, like I said, we want to boost the immunity. We want to also I mean, help him to resist organisms. So we want to give him penicillins in high doses and then metronidazole, which are also usually prescribed. So care for the lesion. You pack the cavities, you know, there has been cavities. You, that is the lesions has created cavities or holes in there. You pack the cavities with gauze, parts soaked in hydro, uh, hydrochloride, that is uh, isol, or even normal saline. You change the tissue dressings often and you keep them moist by adding more solution to the outer layers, feeding and electrolytes. Now you can usually correct his protein energy malnutrition. You know, we talked about poor nutrition being one of the contributing factors or precipitating factors to cancrum oris. So what we're saying is, once we are able to identify this condition in the child, why don't we help to uh, boosting the, in the, the child's imu I mean, immunity by nourishing him, giving him um, adequate nutrition in order to strengthen uh, his immunity. So you can usually correct his protein energy malnutrition by feeding him by mouth. If his mouth is too sore, you feed him through an NG tube. So if the mouth is too devastated that he cannot feed through, then you need to use an NG tube. Surgical intervention in cancrum oris. Over here, we do reconstructive plastic surgery to repair the devastated tissues. So those devastated or those uh, cases that I'm talking about the pictures that you saw earlier on, those pictures can actually be subjected to plastic surgery and their face will be returned to normal. Repair can give back facial function such as eating, speaking, and smiling. Reconstruction is usually very challenging and should be delayed until full recovery, usually about one year following initial intervention. So when the client is first identified, and is put on medication and nourishment, the client is allowed to uh, go through this nourishment and medication until he or she fully recovers in terms of nutritional status 
and in terms of infection, any infection or something, then from there, the client will now be subjected to the plastic surgery. What are some complications that are likely to happen in this condition? Dehydration is one of them, especially when they have this condition and they are not able to feed, they can become dehydrated. Sepsis, you can imagine, we have organisms we refer to as opportunistic organisms, bacteria, they are opportunistic. They are always roaming around looking for who to devour. So whenever they get the slightest opportunity, all of them will climb, will, will climb there or will jump in and then they will worsen the situation. So it can lead to uh, sepsis. Then airway compromise. This condition can be devastating to the extent that even the airway will be compromised in a way. The nostrils could be devastated and even taking in air becomes a problem. Facial disfigurement. So you saw, you saw those two uh, previous pictures that I showed you. You can see how disfigured their faces looked like. Then we have trismus, that is mucosal destruction and contracture of the mouth. So tissues and mucus of the mouth are destroyed to the extent that he or she is not able to even open the mouth again. We call it trismus. Then psychological trauma. You can imagine if you have a child who looks like the pictures that I showed you, how comfortable will you be taking that child out? Or if it is even an adult, how comfortable would that adult be when he or she is in public? So that is definitely going to create a lot of psychological trauma to the client and relatives. Prognosis. When we talk about prognosis, we're talking about a possible outcome. Is the outcome likely good or bad? That's what prognosis means. So let me give you examples of problem for instance if you have a condition like a uh, common cold the prognosis is very good majority of people may not even take anything and the condition will resolve on their own but go gets a condition like rabies or tetanus the prognosis is very bad the probability of you living is very very less even less than one percent about 99 percent of them die now so prognosis when it comes to cancrum oris, there is high morbidity and mortality rate in cancrum oris. The World Health Organization estimates that about 70 to 90% of cases of cancrum oris happen to die. So that is the prognosis for you. Okay, so like I told you earlier on, uh, under cancrum oris, when the client is going for plastic surgery, he or she will need to go through all the preoperative management, including psychological management, where you have to welcome the client, reassure them, you teach them on the condition, you let them ask questions that you answer, they sign a consent form, and then you talk about physical preparation, you talk about physiological preparation, talk about socioeconomic preparation, and even spiritual preparation. So all these will fall Will, will, will be applied in preparing a client who is going for plastic surgery and the cancrum oris. When they come back from the theater after the plastic surgery, all the post-operative management that we did or we talked about earlier today will also be applied. So that brings us to the end of cancrum oris and we are moving on directly to the next topic which is cleft lip cleft lip. Cleft lip refers to an opening in the upper lip that may extend into the nose. The opening may be on one side, both sides, or in the middle. So you have someone whose lip is opened. This lip may open just very small or it may open all the way into the nose. We call it a cleft lip. A cleft lip is formed on the top of the lip as either a small gap or an indentation in the lip. We call it partial or incomplete cleft. A cleft lip may also continue into the nose. So this one is a complete cleft. 
cleft lip can occur as one-sided, which is referred to as unilateral cleft lip, or it may be two-sided. So you have the cleft lip occurring on this, the left side and then the right side. This one is referred to as a bilateral cleft lip. The condition was previously known as the hair lip due to similarity to the rabbit. But then, this term is now generally considered to be offensive, so it is no longer used. So this is a picture of a cleft lip. You can see how it looks like. And this is a unilateral cleft lip. You can see that it is only one side. That is the left side of the lip that is cleft. And it is not complete because it has not extended into the nostril. So it is, this picture you are seeing is a unilateral incomplete cleft lip. Let's look at the second picture. This is a unilateral complete cleft lip. You can see the clefting is still on one side, the left side, and it has extended all the way into the nostril. So this is a complete cleft, but then it is unilateral because it is one-sided. So unilateral complete cleft lip. You can see this one, which is on both sides. You have one on this side, one on that side. And it has gone all the way into the nostril as well. So it is complete. And it is bilateral. So this is a bilateral complete cleft lip. All right. Let's look at the next one, which is cleft palate. Cleft palate. Cleft palate is a condition in which the two plates of the skull that form the hard palate that is the roof of the mouth, are not completely joined. Thus, in a cleft palate, the roof of the mouth contains an opening into the nose. If you lift your tongue in your mouth, the structure you, 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 your tongue touches up of the mouth, that is the roof of the mouth, we call it the palate. We have the soft palate and then the hard palate. So this structure actually uh, is part of the skull which extends to form the roof of the mouth. In a situation whereby this structure is not fully uh, unified or joined together, it forms a whole. And this hole is referred to as a clefting of the palate. Thus, in a cleft palate, the roof of the mouth contains an opening into the nose. In most cases, cleft lip is also present. So in most cases of cleft palate, you also have a cleft lip. Cleft palate occurs in about one in 700 live births worldwide. So every 700 children that are born in this world, you can get at least one of them developing a cleft lip, a cleft palate. Palate cleft or cleft palate can occur as a complete, that is soft and hard palate, possibly including a gap in the, in the jaw or incomplete, that is a hole in the roof of the mouth usually as a cleft soft palate. So what we are saying is the cleft palate has also gotten a complete cleft palate or an incomplete cleft palate. The complete cleft palate is an opening in both the soft and then the hard palate all the way through into the nostrils. If you've forgotten your anatomy, I will urge you to go back and read on the structures of the mat, and you will get to know what the, the palates are, and then you can understand what exactly we are talking about here. When cleft palate occurs, the uvula is usually split. Anatomy will show you what the uvula is, 
I know the majority of you still remember. If you don't remember, refer to the uvula. It occurs due to the failure or fusion of the lateral palatine processes, the nasal septum, and all the medial palatine processes. Reading the structures of the mouth or the base of the skull generally will give you what all these structures are, the medium palatine, because I cannot demonstrate it here. Cleft lip may be technically known as chiloschisis and cleft palate as palatoschisis. So whenever you see chiloschisis, we are referring to cleft lip. Whenever you come across palatoschisis, that is referring to cleft palate. All right. So look at it. This one is not very clear, but you can see it. That is an incomplete cleft palate. You can see that there is an indentation, a dark indentation in there. This dark indentation is not extending to the other part. It is just on one part. That is a soft palate. So let's see the next picture. You can see this one is a unilateral complete cleft lip and palate we did this one in fact the cleft lip you've already seen it already you've seen what the pictures looks like and this one we are showing you the palate itself you can see that this one the palate both the soft and the hard palate have been split they are not unified so that is a complete cleft palate including the lip as well so you can see this one is double-stranded and they are complete as well. So this is bilateral, complete cleft lip and palate. Etiology. We are looking at etiology or causative factors or causes of cleft lip and palate. The causes, the cause is unknown, but we have predisposing factors. In fact, there are several situations or conditions that scientists have not been fully able to tell exactly what is happening or what is causing these problems. Just like uh, what the current pandemic we are experiencing, where we have coronaviruses, we have a lot of I mean, theories. Some are saying it is coming from the sea, others are saying it was manufactured from the lab, others are saying they are coming from some pangolins. So it is not really specific. No one can tell exactly where they are coming from. But what we know is that we have coronaviruses in the system that are destroying a lot of things. So similar to this situation, we don't know what exactly causes cleft lips and palates. But what we know is that there are certain factors that can predispose a child from being born with a cleft lip or palate. Smoking during pregnancy. So women who smoke and then they get pregnant and cannot stop smoking but continue to smoke actually predisposes their fetuses from developing, uh, I mean to developing cleft palates and cleft lips. Diabetic mothers. So research has shown that a lot of mothers who are diabetics tend to give birth and their children uh, develop cleft lips and palates. An older mother, mothers who uh, give birth to their children at an advanced age, I mean from 35 and above, they stand a very high chance of giving birth to children who, or babies who have cleft lips or palate. Then obesity, mothers who are obese also stands a very high chance of giving birth to babies who have this abnormality. Drugs such as anticonvulsants, anticonvulsants uh, in gestation. So mothers who during pregnancy, maybe they develop some conditions and want to give them certain medications that are anticonvulsants like the benzodiazepines, phenytoins, and the rest. These ones are anticonvulsants, and they predispose a child to the development of cleft lip or palate. 
what are some problems that are associated with cleft lift and palate or cleft palate? Definitely feeding becomes a problem. Children who have cleft lip have feeding problems. So you can imagine, look at the pictures you saw. How will this child be able to feed normally? They also develop speech problem. They are not able to talk properly. Hearing loss. So sometimes they tend to have problems with their hearing. Hearing impairment is particularly prevalent in children with cleft palate. The tensor muscle fibers that open the eustachian tubes lack an anchor to function effectively. So what we are trying to say is that the tensor muscle, anatomy will teach you what the tensor muscles are, are supposed to function effectively in order to help this child to be able to hear properly. But unfortunately, children who have cleft palate in particular have gotten a malfunctioning tensor muscles. So as a result of these, they have problems or difficulties hearing properly. Surgical intervention in cleft lip. Within the first two to three months after birth, surgery is performed to close the cleft lip. So a child or an infant between two to three months can actually be subjected to a successful cleft lip repair. With while surgery to repair a cleft lip can be performed soon after birth, often the preferred age at approximately 10 weeks of age, following the rules of tens, which was coined by the surgeons, I mean the surgeons Wilhelmensen and then Musgrave in 1960, 1969. And I will tell you what the rules of tens are. So what we are saying is, even though within two to three months, uh, an infant who has a cleft lip can get it repaired by plastic surgery. But then, the preferred period is approximately 10 weeks of age. And this is following what we refer to as the rule of tens. Remember this could be an objective question. The rules of tens. And it was coined by the surgeons Wilhelm Mensen and Musgrave in 1969. So what do we mean by the rule of tens? The rule of tens uh, mean that the child is at least 10 weeks of age, the child weighs at least 10 pounds, and the child has at least 10 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. Okay, so the rule of tens have three components. The child should be at least 10 weeks old. The child should weigh at least 10 pounds. And then this child should have at least 10 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. If the child lacks in any of these, you don't subject him or her to the surgical repair. If the cleft is bilateral and extensive, two surgeries may be required to close the cleft one side first and the second side a few weeks later. Children with a cleft palate may need a bone graft when they are about eight years old to fill in the upper gum so that it can support permanent teeth and stabilize the upper jaw. About 20% of children with a cleft palate require further surgeries to help improve their speech. So, with cleft palate problems or surgeries, it is not just once. You do it and you keep working on it until you get a perfect shape or perfect posture. Once the permanent teeth grow in, braces are often needed to straighten the teeth. Additional surgeries may be performed to improve the appearance of the lip and nose in order to close openings between the mouth and the nose, help breathing and then stabilize and realign the jaw. So it is not as easy as you think because 
a lot of surgeries will have to take place, which are all plastic surgeries, in order to restore this abnormality to normal. Final repairs of the scars left by the initial surgeries will probably not be performed until adolescence, when the facial structure is more fully developed. Dental care in cleft lips and palates. So a child that is suffering from cleft lip or cleft palate, we're going to look at how you will care for their dentures or their teeth. Generally, the preventive and restorative dental care, dental care needs of children with clefts are the same as for, the, for other children. However, children with cleft lip and cleft palate may have special problems related to missing, malformed, or malpositioned teeth, and that require close, I mean, close monitoring. What I'm saying is, the care of the mouth and the teeth of a child who suffers from cleft lip or palate is not different from the care that is given to those who have no such problems. But then, because of the malformations, you need to tread cautiously in order not to cause more problems for the child. Early dental care. Like other children, children born with cleft lip and cleft palate require proper cleaning, good nutrition, and fluoride treatment in order to have healthy teeth. So you need to clean the teeth as often as possible so that you don't have debris and bacteria growing in them in order to cause uh, dental caries. You also need to provide this child with good nutrition because the poorer the nutrition, the higher the condition is likely to worsen. But the stronger or the healthier the nutrition, the faster the condition is likely to improve with surgical management. Appropriate cleaning with a small soft bristled toothbrush should begin as soon as the teeth erupts. If a, if a, soft, um, if a soft children's toothbrush will not adequately clean the teeth because of the modified shape of the mat and the teeth, a soft clean towel can be used with water or tomato juice. This also helps to clean the teeth very well. Feeding a child with cleft lip or palate. Place the baby in an upright sitting position to prevent the formula from flowing back into the nose area. So we don't want the child to be in lying position because this could easily cause the food that you are feeding the child with to flow backwards and can get the child aspirated. Keep the bottle tilted so that the nipple is always filled with milk and pointed down away from the cleft. The baby will move the nipple into the most comfortable position for him or her. So what we are saying is tilt the bottle that you are using to feed the baby well so that the nipple of the bottle is always filled with milk. If you don't tilt it well and you do it this way, the, bottle, the baby will be struggling to pull the milk. As the baby feeds, some milk may escape through the nose. This is very common and expected, and it does not mean the baby is choking. Because of the clefting, you are likely to have the baby, some of the milk, dripping out. Hold the baby in a more upright position as this will lessen the amount of milk coming out through the nose. Babies with a cleft lip need to, I mean, babies with cleft lip and palate need to be burped more often because they take in more air while feeding. So what we're saying is, a baby who has a cleft lip or palate, mostly when he or she is feeding, he takes in a lot of air through the abnormal opening. So as a result of that, 
he or she needs to burp frequently. Burping is when you tap the back of the child until he or she brings out the air through the mouth. So you have to frequently do this, knowing well that the child is taking more air. Watch for signs of discomfort. The baby will give you signs when it is time to stop and burp. Post-operative management after cleft lip repair. The first two weeks. Now, with this post-operative management, all the other pre-post, I mean, the post-operative management that we did earlier on holds here. Having to prepare the bed, having to accept the client, assess that the client is alive, nutrition and all of that. It's also false here. We are going to look at some, from some specifics in this particular condition. The first two weeks, after a child's surgery, the cleft lip repair is not strong enough to resist damage that could be caused by foreign objects or even the fingers of the child. To prevent injury, promote healing, and maintain the child's comfort, it is important that the following instructions are followed after the surgery. So let's look at the feeding instructions postoperatively. During the first week after surgery, the infant will be fed either with a syringe fitted with special soft tubing or a special cleft lip feeder called the Heberman feeder. You fit the Heberman feeder on a syringe or on a special lip feeder. And the goal of doing this is to prevent the child from having to suck hard on the formula or milk and thus it protect newly repaired lips. So we don't want the child to suck too hard on the formula. When that, is, that happens, it could cause impairment of the repaired part of the lips or the palate. Formula and pumped breast milk can both be given in the feeder. Lip care. Parents should not touch or handle the child's lip. That is a surgical area. Allow any dried blood or crusty material to fall off on its own. Dressing the incisional wound is done as ordered by the surgeon. Any object the child puts in or around the mouth, including the child's fingers, can ruin the repair. So what do we do? Because the child will definitely be throwing the fingers here and there, the hands here and there. Therefore, the child must wear arm restraints, splints, that is splints, for the first 10 days after surgery. Sometimes we actually splint the arms so that some even go to the sense of tying the arms a little too softly or snugly to the uh, uh, cut in order to prevent the child from touching the incisional site and ruining the surgical process. There must not be, this must not be removed unless in an emergency or with a physician consent. We are talking about the restraints. Keep the child on his or her back for one week to avoid having the lip rub on the sheet or carpet. So the child is supposed to be in the, the lying, I mean, lying on the back, not in the prone position. If not, he will rub the lips against the pillows or the bed linings, and this will ruin the surgical incision. Relief of pain. The child will have mild to moderate pain, definitely. Liquid acetaminophen can be given as prescribed. Education of parents. Educate parents to report back to the hospital in the event of any of the following. A fever. When the child starts to spike temperature above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Severe pain or relieved Severe pain, not relieved by the pain medication. So you are giving this child some pain relieving medication. If the child 
is not responding to this or the pain still persists, the child becomes restless and cries excessively, you may have to report back to the hospital. Vomiting and or diarrhea. When the child starts to vomit or having diarrhea, that one as well you have to report. Bleeding from or any change in the suture line, area of surgery. We are talking about whether the, if the child starts to bleed from the surgical area or any change like reddening at the side, like past drainage from the side or inflammation, swelling at the side, you have to report back to the hospital. Any direct injury to the repaired lip. Drainage from the incision that looks like pass or smells bad. So, these are specific post-operative management that are specifically applied to surgeries related to chiloschisis and palatoschisis. So that brings us to the end of cleft lip and cleft palate. All right, so let's continue with um, diseases of the esophagus. So we have looked at three major conditions. We've looked at cancrum oris of the mouth. We've looked at cleft lip. We've looked at cleft palate. Now we are going to diseases and abnormalities of the esophagus. Now we all know that the esophagus extends from the mouth all the way to the stomach. So conditions that are related to the esophagus includes the first one will be achalasia. Achalasia. Achalasia is a condition that affects the ability of the esophagus to move food into the stomach. So there are individuals who will swallow, try to they put food in the mouth, they try to swallow, and the food will get stagnated within the esophagus, finding it difficult to descend all the way into the stomach. And it will be as a result of an abnormality which we refer to as achalasia. With achalasia, the muscle that forms a ring at the point where the esophagus and the stomach meet, called the lower esophageal sphincter, normally relaxes when you swallow. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to say is, you know about the sphincters, right? The lower esophageal sphincter, when you, it is not just like a canal, you put it, the food in your, in your mouth, and then the food descends straight forward and falls into the stomach. No, there is a sphincter at the lower end, the meeting point of the esophagus to the stomach. This sphincter will have to open up, relax and open up for the food to descend from the esophagus into the stomach. But with people suffering from achalasia, the lower esophageal sphincter does not or is not able to relax enough. So as a result of that, the food that is within the esophagus and is trying to descend into the stomach is not able to go. So it gets stagnated in the esophagus, struggling to get into the stomach. So achalasia is basically related to a condition in which the lower esophageal sphincter finds it very difficult to relax enough to allow food to get emptied out of the esophagus into the stomach. In addition, the normal muscle, muscle activity of the esophagus, that is peristalsis, is reduced. Whenever you think of peristalsis, peristalsis, think about movement of food or content through the intestine, I mean, the, a tube. Let's say when we were kids, whenever um, our parents killed a fowl or something, sometimes they did give us the intestines to, 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 to roast and eat or boil and eat or something. And you don't just roast it like that, but you need to get the fecal matter in the intestine to come out. How do we do it? You have to hold one tip of the intestine like this, and then with a peristaltic movement, you are able to propel the fecal content within the intestine out. That process is an example of peristaltic movement. So anything, food that enters into the esophagus actually is propelled by peristaltic movement from the esophagus into the stomach. So in a situation whereby the peristaltic activity of the muscles of the esophagus is reduced 
it is not able to propel the food or yeah, food from the esophagus into the stomach, coupled with the fact that the lower severe sphincter is also cachetic, it has become hardened, it's not able to relax enough to allow food to enter into the stomach. So these two major problems are what causes the condition we refer to as achalasia. Now, incidence of achalasia. Achalasia is rare. It's not a condition that is very common. It may occur in any age, but it is most common in middle-aged or older adults. So these are the people who mostly suffer from this condition. The middle-aged individuals and then the older adults. The condition may be inherited in some people. Etiology. The cause of most cases of achalasia is unknown. Clinical manifestations. Now, when somebody is suffering from the condition called achalasia, he or she will manifest the following signs and symptoms. The first one is dysphagia. And dysphagia is difficulty in swallowing. In this case, the individual gets the food into the esophagus from the mouth, but finds it difficult to get the food into the stomach. We refer to it as dysphagia. And this is the major or the main symptom of achalasia. There is also regurgitation of undigested food. Regurgitation talks about food in the stomach climbing up back into the esophagus. That's all referred to as regurgitation. So you see that there is food in the stomach which has not been digested and then it flows back into the esophagus again. There is chest pain behind the sternum. The chest pain experience can often be mistaken for a heart attack. So people suffering from achalasia may have chest pain. That is burning sensation this is as a result of the food refluxing back into the esophagus. Remember, there is hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So anything that enters into the stomach mixes with this hydrochloric acid, becomes acidified. So if it regurgitates back into the esophagus, which is not adapted to live comfortably with acid, then you can imagine that the acid is going to cause burning sensation in the esophagus and this is going to manifest as pain or chest pain or burning sensation. These people tend to lose weight and I believe you can guess why. The individual is not able to eat effectively so how is he or she going to get well nourished and then to gain weight? Coughing when lying in a horizontal position. So whenever they lie in a horizontal position they tend to cough and this is as a result of possible content refluxing back into the esophagus, inducing coughing reflexes. Diagnostic investigations. So what are we going to do to ascertain or confirm that the condition we are looking at is an, I mean, achalasia? The first one is barium swallow. Barium swallow. So barium swallow is a diagnostic uh, investigation that the client is made to swallow something we call a barium meal. So you swallow the meal and then um, images are taken in order to see whether the meal, the barium meal that is being swallowed is going smoothly or there is any blockade somewhere. So that is going to identify to us whether peristaltic movement within the esophagus is fine, whether the lower sphincter sphincter is normal or is not normal. We also want to do esophageal manometry. We want to do endoscopy. I want to do endoscopic ultrasound or ultrasound scan. So these will help to ascertain whether the condition we are looking at is achalasia or not. Management of achalasia. The goal of treatment in achalasia is to reduce the pressure at the lower esophageal sphincter. Therapy may involve the following. Initial management includes small frequent feeding and soft warm foods and fluids.
patient is advised to avoid hot and spicy foods as well as alcohol. Injection with botulinum toxin, that is Botox. This will help relax the sphincter, that is the lower via sphincter. However, the benefits wears off within a few weeks or months, which means it needs to be repeated over and over again. Medications such as long-acting nitric or calcium channel blockers. These drugs can be used to relax the lower esophageal sphincter. So all our target is to relax the lower esophageal sphincter so that the content that is coming out of the mat through the mat into the esophagus can easily move down into the stomach. Now widening. We also, or dilatation, we also want to do what we call widening or dilatation of the esophagus at the location of a narrowing, uh, of the narrowing. So this surgery, which can be done, this is a surgical intervention, which can be done in order to widen a part of the esophagus that might have been narrowed, is called esophagomyotomy. So an esophagomyotomy is a surgical intervention that is done to widen a, a narrowed part of the esophagus in order to allow content within the, the mouth or the esophagus to flow smoothly, smoothly into the stomach. This process may be needed to decrease the pressure in the lower sphincter. Complications that are associated with achalasia. Regurgitation of acid food from the stomach into the esophagus that is reflexes. This can lead to a condition called GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Then we have breathing food contents into the lungs. We call it aspiration. So food content or particles can be breathed or aspirated into the lungs. And these can lead to aspiration pneumonia. Then tearing or perforation of the esophagus. So constant pressure exerted on the esophagus as a result of refusal or inability of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax enough will cause too much pressure in the esophagus and this could lead to uh, perforation within the esophagus. Now, so the surgical intervention that is Osophago myotomy is the surgery that is done to widen the esophagus. It is a minor surgery, and when the client is supposed to be subjected to this, he or she will still go through the normal preoperative management and then the postoperative management at the end of the day. Now let's look at esophageal strictures. So the first one was achalasia. We are looking at esophageal strictures. Esophageal strictures. So this is the narrowing of the esophagus, usually following fibrosis of the lining of the esophageal wall. So if something happened to the esophageal wall, the lining of the esophageal wall, the tissues of the esophagus, and as a result of that, it led to maybe scars or fibrosis, this could eventually make the esophagus to become narrowed and this will impede upon content ability to move smoothly into the stomach. We call it esophageal strictures. The stricture may be short and localized, multiple or long. This makes swallowing difficult, also referred to as dysphagia. Stomach acid accidentally swallowed harsh chemicals and other irritants may injure the esophageal lining causing inflammation, that is esophagitis, and the formation of scar tissues. You know, I told you earlier on that people who are even suffering from achalasia could have refluxes of acid from the stomach into the esophagus. Now, the esophagus is not adapted, it was not created to live with acid. So when acid gets access to that place, it will cause tissue destruction within the lining of the esophagus. When eventually this tissue happens, it heals, 
it could lead to scars. This is what we call fibrosis. Fibrous tissue will form within the lining of the esophagus. If this continue for a long time, it will cause a lot of fibrosis, and this will impede upon food's ability to go through smoothly from the esophagus into the stomach. This condition is referred to as esophageal stricture. This may gradually lead to obstruction of the esophagus, preventing food and fluids from reaching the stomach smoothly. Incidence of esophageal strictures. Gastroesophageal reflux disease affects approximately 40% of adults. Strictures occurs in 7 to 23% of patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease who are untreated. So what we're saying is, I have already mentioned this, with a gastroesophageal reflux disease, that is any situation that will cause content within the stomach to reflux back into the esophagus. People suffer from this condition, and it is a condition we refer to as GERD. And we are saying that about 40% of people in the world actually suffers from GERD at any uh, given point in time. And what we are saying is, out of these people who suffer from GERD, about 7 to 23% of them are likely to suffer from strictures, osophageal strictures, as a result of this GERD. Etiology. Gastroesophageal, I told you etiology means cause. What are the causes of osophageal strictures? Gastroesophageal reflux disease is one of the causative factors. We have oesophagitis. Oesophagitis talks about infection or inflammation of the oesophagus. Anything could cause oesophagitis, like even bacterial infection or any harsh chemical that has been swallowed or um, a poisonous substance or something could cause problems, lesions or infection within the oesophagus, and this will lead to oesophagitis. This oesophagitis, when it eventually heals, it will leave behind fibrous tissues or scars, and this fibrosis will cause impediment of food's movement smoothly into the stomach. That is what we refer to as stricture. Another causative factor is a dysfunctional lower esophageal sphincter. That is, when the lower esophageal sphincter becomes dysfunctional, dysfunctional means that when you need it to open, it will not open. When you need it to close, it will not close. So if the that is, it becomes incompetent, that is uh, incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter. When it becomes incompetent, content within the stomach can reflux back into the esophagus at any point in time because the sphincter doesn't close back. So acidic content moves into the esophagus and then it can eventually lead to GERD and then it can eventually lead to esophageal stricture. Then we have hiatal hernia. Hiatal hernia. So hiatal hernia is a hernia that affects the area where the diaphragm connects or the diaphragm uh, so, uh, is, is bounded around the stomach. So in this case, what happens is that the esophagus pushes or the stomach and the, at the point where the esophagus is pushes through the hiatal part of the hiat. I mean, I'm talking about the hiatal area, the hiatus. The esophagus pushes through it and as a result of this, content within the stomach but as we go on, I will show you a picture that will clearly demonstrate what I'm talking about. So with the hiatal hernia, it also impairs the ability of acid to be able to remain within the stomach and can easily reflux back into the stomach. And then we have swallowed harsh chemicals, where you have chemicals that have been swallowed that uh, have affected the integrity of the tissues within the esophagus. It has caused abrasion, it has caused destruction to the tissues. When it eventually heals, like I said, it will leave behind scars, fibrous tissues, and this impedes upon content's ability to move smoothly into the stomach. Then we have esophageal surgery. 
while the area heals, a scar forms, causing the tissue to pull and tighten, leading to difficulty in swallowing. When you have any abnormality within the, the oesophagus, and as a result of these, a surgical incision or a surgical operation is performed. The surgical operation that is performed, remember, definitely there is going to be a cut or incision there. When this incisional area heals, it can leave behind some fibrous tissues or some scars. And what we are saying is that these scars could make swallowing difficult. Clinical manifestations of oesophageal stricture, heart burns, bitter or acid taste in the mouth, coughing, shortness of breath, frequent burping or hiccups, and then pain or trouble swallowing. How are we able to confirm or ascertain that the client we are looking at is suffering from oesophageal stricture? It can be diagnosed with an x-ray while the patient swallows a barium. So I told you what a barium swallow is. When a, bar I mean a barium meal is being swallowed, Images are taken, like X-ray images, and these images will be able to tell where there are obstructions preventing content from moving in smoothly. Then computerized tomographic scan, that is a CT scan. We can also take a biopsy um, when you suspect a malignancy. So we want to take tissue biopsy of the oesophagus. Tissue biopsy means that you take a small tissue from the structure or the organ or the oesophagus, take it to the lab so that they will investigate it to see whether the tissue you are looking at or the organ or structure you are looking at is cancerous or not. The endoscopy. The endoscopy will also tell us whether there is an oesophageal structure or not. Then hemoglobin and serum electrolytes are also checked. Management. How do we manage an oesophageal stricture? We have resection of the stenose part, which may be necessary. In a situation whereby it is a congenital problem, there is a congenital narrowing of the oesophagus. The surgeon can do a resection that is cut out the part that is narrowed and then connect the normal parts together. We call it a resection of the stenose part if necessary. If it is caused by oesophagitis, like I said, there was an infection or inflammation in oesophagus, and as a result of that, there is tissue destruction and healing has taken place and it has left behind fibrosis or scars. It is commonly treated by treating the infection, typically with antibiotics. So what we are saying is, if the problem is as a result of infection or inflammation, we want to give antibiotics. These antibiotics will heal or will kill the organisms and the wounds will get healed. It may leave behind some tissues. I'm talking about uh, fibrosis or scars, as we said earlier on, which may only need a surgical repair to clear it off. Then we have corrosive or traumatic strictures. If we have corrosive or traumatic strictures, in order to open up the stricture, a surgeon can insert something we call a boogie. A boogie is a metallic tool that is mostly inserted in order to dilate or open up the oesophagus. So when this is done, it tries to open up the part that has been constricted or stenosed or narrowed so that content can easily move smoothly into the stomach. It can sometimes be treated with other medications, for instance, an H2 antagonist, example, ranitidine or even semitidine, or protein pump inhibitors such as omeprazole. These can treat underlying acid reflux diseases. So these medications, what it does is that they will reduce the amount of acid that is produced such that the acid, there won't be too much acid in order to reflux back into the oesophagus, in order not to cause problems with swallowing. 
So that is it for oesophageal stricture. We move on to oesophageal atresia. Oesophageal atresia. So with oesophagus, we've talked about achalasia, where we have two major problems that are causing this inability of the lower oesophageal sphincter to relax. And as a result of that, food is not able to move smoothly into the stomach. And then poor peristaltic movement of the muscle layer of the oesophagus. So because of that, it is not able to propel food content smoothly into the stomach. That is a calicia for you. And with oesophageal stricture, we talked about a situation whereby the oesophagus is narrowed. It could be a congenital narrowing. That is, the child was born with it, or the person was born with it. Or it is as a result of tissue fibrosis, as a result of maybe trauma or infection or uh, some uh, traumatic, yes, traumatic activity that has occurred within the oesophagus, caused the wound and the wound has healed, and as a result of that, it has left behind tissue uh, fibrosis or scars, and because of that, it has led to narrowing of the oesophagus. So anything that will cause narrowing of the esophagus will lead to what we call esophageal stricture. So let's look at the third one, which is esophageal atresia. So um, esophageal atresia literally means without a canal or lumen. Without a canal or lumen. Whenever you hear, yes, basically put, whenever you hear atresia, it means without a canal or lumen. So the thing has closed up, or a tube that was supposed to be hollow, that tube is not patent to the end. It means there is an occlusion somewhere. That is what is meant by anatresia. Medically, it is used to describe congenital conditions in which part of the length of the tube in the body either has no lumen or has one that is very grossly reduced in size. So medically, whenever you hear the word atresia, we are referring to the fact that a tube or a canal within the body is closed. Or if it is not totally closed, it is so narrow to the extent that it cannot do the play the function or the role that it is supposed to play. That is what is meant by atresia. So when we say oesophageal atresia, knowing very well that an os the oesophagus is a tube, a canal, when you hear oesophageal atresia, we then imply that uh, there is lack of a lumen in a part of the oesophagus, or there is a reduction in the size of the lumen. It is said that a portion of the oesophagus is totally occluded, or it is so grossly narrow to the extent that it cannot play the role as, as an oesophagus effectively. There is usually also an abnormal connection between the oesophagus and the trachea. Remember, the trachea is just behind the oesophagus. So what we're saying is, in oesophageal atresia, apart from the fact that the oesophagus may be occluded or the canal may be narrow to some extent, sometimes there is also an abnormal connection between the oesophagus and then the trachea, which is not supposed to be normal. With that one, it gives rise to something we call tracheoesophageal fistula. A fistula is an abnormal opening between two structures. So the abnormal opening between the oesophagus and the trachea is a tracheo oesophageal fistula. All right. So, we are going to look at the various types of oesophageal atresia. So, let's look at type 1 oesophageal atresia or type A oesophageal atresia. In type A, the normal structure of the oesophagus can be seen. So, look at it here. In this case, you can see that the oesophagus, everything is normal. You can see that the trachea is there, the oesophagus too is there, and there is no connection between them. So this is how normally 
the oesophagus is supposed to be. It, the oesophagus is the brownish one. Is it pink? Brown, brownish one that connects to the stomach. Whereas the one behind, which is tubular and circular in nature, like rings, that is the trachea for you. So this trachea is not linked. It is actually going to the lungs, whereas the oesophagus also connects to the stomach. So this is how normally the anatomy of the oesophagus is supposed to look like. Okay, so we'll look at type B atresia. Type B atresia. In type B atresia, both the oesophageal segments are blind. In type B atresia, both the oesophageal segments are blind porches and either has a fistulous connection to the airway. So look at it here. This is the image of it. You can see that the oesophagus, um, the upper part, in fact, the oesophagus is not true. The oesophagus is cut in the middle, upper part is occluded, down part is occluded. So this person, when he swallows food, the food will only be in the oesophagus. It cannot enter into the stomach because it is blinded. There is atresia here, atresia there, occlusion on the top. So the oesophagus is only hanging. It, can, it is not connected to the stomach. So that is a type B atresia, type B atresia. Let's look at the type C atresia. With the type C atresia, the oesophagus is hanging and then blinded. And then the lower part of the oesophagus is fistulated to the trachea. That is a type C for you. So let's see what exactly is there. In type C, tracheoesophageal fistula, which is the commonest, the lower section the lower section ascends from the stomach and connects with the trachea by the short fistulous tract. Basically put, what I'm trying to say is that the oesophagus is hanging, the one that is coming from the mouth is hanging, it is not connected to the stomach, and the portion that is also coming from the stomach, that was supposed to connect from the one that is coming from the mouth, is rather connected to the trachea. So what do you think is likely to happen here? Content, when the person breathes, some air will be entering into the stomach. And then the person eats food through the mouth and the food will not enter into the stomach. That is what will happen in the type C atresia. Let's look at the type D atresia. See the image? With the type D atresia, you can see that the oesophagus is actually continuous into the stomach. But unfortunately, there is a fistula connecting the oesophagus to the trachea. Let's see. Type D, this is also known as type H, or tracheoesophageal fistula without atresia. The fistula, which may be as small, may be as small as a pinpoint, is usually higher in the trachea than in the oesophagus. So what we are saying is, there is a link between the oesophagus to the trachea. So in this case, when the person breathes, content, I mean, air will be entering into the stomach, and also content from the stomach can reflux and enter into the trachea, leading to aspiration. Let's look at type E and type F, type F atresias. Let me show you the images first. So this is type E atresia. The part that is coming from above, connected separately to the uh, trachea. The part of the oesophagus coming from the mouth is fistulated to the trachea. And then the remaining segment of the oesophagus connecting to the stomach is also fistulated to the trachea. With this one, the part of the oesophagus coming from the mouth is fistulated to the trachea, whereas the part that is coming from the stomach is hanging, not connected to anything. Now, let's see what is there. In type E and type F, 
the upper portion of the oesophagus opens into the trachea. So do you think, what do you think is going to happen here? In this case, the upper portion of the oesophagus is opened into the trachea. So this one, when the person eats food from the mouth, the food enters the mouth, enters into the oesophagus, where do you think the food is going to? Look at the image. So the food is going directly into the lungs. So the baby eats, drinks, or takes in breast milk, and the breast milk goes directly into the lungs. Okay, so like I said, in type E and type F, the upper portion of the oesophagus opens into the trachea. In type E, additional fistula connects the trachea and the oesophagus at a lower level. Infants with either anomaly may experience life-threatening aspiration of saliva or food. When we say aspiration, we have content that is meant for the stomach rather entering into the lungs. So what we're saying is, because whenever the child feeds, the feed is rather going into the lungs instead of the stomach. So you can see the feed going to the lungs and these can easily kill the infant or the baby. All right. So these are the categories of atresia that we have, osophageal atresia. Let's look at the incidence of osophageal atresia. It occurs in approximately one in 2,500 live births. The most common type in our 85% of cases is a blind upper end with a lower end communicating with the trachea. So that's what we're saying. Which type is that? The blind upper part with the lower part connecting to the trachea. Yes, this one. That is a type C. The upper part is blind and then the lower part connected to the trachea. This is the commonest type that we have. Etiology. Etiology means causative factors or causes. The exact causes of oesophageal atresia is still unknown, but it appears to have some genetic components. Up to half of babies born with oesophageal atresia have one or more other birth defects, such as other digestive tract problems, kidney and urinary tract problems, heart problems, or muscular or skeletal problems. So what we're saying is, apart from the oesophageal anomaly, most children who come to this oesophageal anomaly tend to have other anomalies. Clinical manifestations of oesophageal atresia. The presence of oesophageal atresia is suspected in a newborn with drooling that is frequently accompanied by choking, coughing, and sneezing. So if a newborn infant or baby, neonate, keeps drooling, how we say drooling, content from the mouth coming back, salivating, saliva coming up, back, takes in breast smoke, and the breast smoke is flowing back out. And this child sounds as if he's choking and is coughing and sneezing, you should suspect that there is something wrong. If fed, the infant swallows normally, but suddenly coughs and struggles, and the fluid returns through the nose and the mouth. So this baby fed through the mouth. And after feeding through the mouth, the baby started to, I mean, start to cough immediately and sneezing, and this breast milk flows out of the mouth and the nose. Where did the food get into the nose? So in that case, you know that there is a problem. The infant becomes cyanotic and may stop breathing as the overflow of fluid from the blind porch is aspirated into the trachea or bronchi. So when the content from the oesophagus now enters into the trachea, it blocks the child's ability to take in enough oxygen. So as a result of that, he or she becomes cyanose. You know, when you're not getting adequate oxygenation, you become cyanotic. The cyanosis is as a result of laryngospasm. That is the protective mechanism 
that operates to prevent aspiration into the trachea. In the type C malformation, the stoma becomes distended with air and pressure to the abdomen, especially during crying. This causes the gastric contents to be regurgitated through the fistula into the trachea, producing a chemical pneumonitis. So what we're saying is, when this child, especially the one suffering from the type C atresia, when he cries, uh, you know, he takes in too much air, and this is going to cause bloating. It will cause the abdomen to become distended, creating pressure because remember that the lower esophagus is connected to the trachea. So the more air is entering, the more the tummy becomes bloated. And this can also lead to uh, chemical pneumonia because content from the stomach can easily overflow into the trachea and then into the lungs. And remember, there is already acid within the stomach. When the upper segment of the esophagus opens directly into the trachea, that is the type E and the F, the infant is in danger of aspiration. So what we're saying is, when the upper part of the, in the type E and the type F, you remember the esophagus, the part that is coming from the mouth, is connected to the trachea. In that case, anything you take from the mouth, breast milk, whatever, formula or whatever, the content goes directly into the lungs. And this is going to lead to what we call aspiration. This infant can easily die off. Now, risk factors of esophageal atresia. Two major groups are at risk, and they include infants with polyhydraminous and then premature infants. Polyhydraminous. Your ops and gynae will teach you that when you have too much lycor within the uterus, it could lead to some abnormalities. That's what we call polyhydraminous. And then premature infants, infants that are not fully matured before labor sets in. So they did not get to the right gestational age before they were given birth to. Some of these structures are not fully developed, and as a result of that, they tend to have some of these congenital abnormalities. Diagnostic investigations, how are we able to ascertain that the case we are looking at or the symptoms this child is presenting is likely to be an atresia, sophigial atresia? Inability to pass a catheter into the stomach. So if the child is having an atresia like say the type C, where the esophagus, the part that is coming from the mouth is connected to the trachea, or like the type B, where the upper part is blinded, the part that is coming from the mouth is blinded, the part that is coming from the stomach is blinded, and you're trying to pass a catheter into the stomach. Do you think the catheter will read the stomach? Impossible, it won't read the stomach. So when you are passing the catheter, trying to get stomach content that you're not getting, then you should be worried that there should be an anomaly somewhere. Check X-ray will also show us clearly that there is an atresia. Then we also can do abdominal x-ray to be able to identify what is going on. Management. In tracheosophageal fistula and osophageal atresia, it is required that surgical correction are usually done, and this is emergency surgical operations. When we talk about the tracheosophageal fistula, that is when the trachea is connected, sorry, the esophagus is fistulated or connected to the trachea. This is an emergency surgical surgery, simply because if it is not done, anything that the child feeds is going into the lungs, and that child can die within minutes. The type of surgery and when it is performed depends on the nature of the anomaly. The patient's general condition and the presence of coexisting congenital defects. When a tracheosophageal fistula is suspected, the infant is immediately deprived of oral intake. He or she is started on IV fluids and placed in the most advantageous position to decrease the likelihood of aspiration. That is, the head is elevated for a type C anomaly. So what we're saying is, 
when this child is having a TU, that is tracheosophageal fistula, and it is realized that yes, he's having a tracheosophageal fistula, and you continue to feed that child, what do you think is likely to happen? You are killing the child. Because anything you are feeding is going to the lungs, and that child is going to die. So once it is identified that he's suffering from a TO, you need to stop any oral feeding and start parenteral feeding. So the child will still be nourished parenterally whilst you prepare surgical procedure to repair the situation. Accumulated secretions are suctioned frequently from the mouth and pharynx. A catheter is placed into the upper oesophageal porch. An infant's head is kept in an upright position so that fluid collected in the porch is easily removed and to prevent aspiration of gastro contents. A gastrostomy is usually performed to decompress the stomach and prevent further aspiration of gastric contents by the way of the fistula. Then a broad spectrum antibiotic therapy is started early in pneumonia. Since pneumonia is almost inevitable and appears early. So what we're saying is, because pneumonia is inevitable in this situation, and you all know why pneumonia is inevitable in this situation, we want to start antibiotics such that even when the pneumonia sets in, we have already started our antibiotics and we are likely to keep the child alive. Post-operative management. Patient should be put in the lateral position. NG tube should be kept in position and regular aspiration of contents should be done. NG tube may be kept in C2 for a long duration. All drainage tubes must be properly taken care of. Care of the NG tube and intercostal tubes, if present, should be done. Wound must be dressed according to the doctor's instructions. Pain medications and other drugs must be administered accordingly. Care of the NG tube. Proper fixing of the tube into the nose and the regular observation for displacement is very, very essential. When the NG tube is to be kept for a long time, it may have to be changed with a new tube at regular intervals. Regular cleaning of the sides of the tube, nostril, the mouth, is very essential. So intermittent aspiration of the gastric content, yes. So you know, the content that is in the stomach, we are going to aspirate, we are going to remove it out. And what I'm saying is, as you are picking out the gastric secretion, you need to keep measuring it. You need to keep measuring it so that we know whether we are achieving results or we are not. So this measurement, that's what we are saying, that you can use something like a syringe which is supposed to be done and measured on hourly basis. Post-operative aspiration is continued until patient passes flatus. Bowel sounds appear and tube aspirated content becomes less than 50 ml. Excessive aspiration signifies either the tube is too low, distal obstruction, or there is sepsis. What are some complications in oesophageal atresia. Children with oesophageal atresia can have long-term respiratory difficulties as well as feeding problems and slow growth. You all know why they have feeding problems and you all know why they have um, poor development or poor growth because they are not getting adequate nourishment due to this congenital anomaly of the oesophagus. Sometimes, a stricture will develop in the oesophagus, making it difficult to swallow. This can usually be dilated using a medical instrument called a boogie. I have told you about that. In later life, most children with this disorder 
will have some trouble with either swallowing or heartburns or the both of them. So that brings us to the end of uh, oesophageal atresia. So we've talked about calesia, we've talked about oesophageal strictures, and we have talked about oesophageal atresia. These are the three major abnormalities, surgical abnormalities within the surgery, uh, sorry, within the oesophagus. And like I have told you, any surgical procedure that is performed, your five major modalities, pre-operative management, psychological, physical, socioeconomic, physiological, and spiritual preparation will need to be done. And then post-operatively, some of the isolated or specific ones I have mentioned them. Either than that, all the major post-operative management that we talked about earlier on also holds here. All right, so we are continuing with abnormalities of the stomach. That is surgical conditions that are related to the stomach. I have the structure of the stomach there. We study it carefully. So the first one is pyloric stenosis. Pyloric stenosis. Whenever you hear the word stenosis in medicine, we're talking about narrowing of a lumen within the body. Narrowing. So pyloric stenosis is a gastrointestinal anomaly in which the pylorous muscles thicken and become abnormally large. This blocks food from reaching the small intestines. So let's look at this structure here. You can see the upper part of the stomach being the fundus the upper part being the fundus, you can see that. And then we have the body. And then we have the pyloric part, which is the lower part that is connected to the intestines. So what we're saying is, when the part, the lower part, that is the pyloric part, becomes tenuous or narrowed, food from the stomach will now not be able to distend from the stomach through this pyloric area into the intestines. So this abnormality makes it difficult for food from the stomach to descend into the intestines. So I'm saying that the pyloric stenosis actually blocks food from reaching the small intestines. Let's look at etiology. The causes of pyloric stenosis are unknown, but genetic and environmental factors might play a role. It is believed that genetic factors, in addition to certain environmental precipitants, play a role in the causation of pyloric stenosis. Pyloric stenosis usually isn't present at birth and probably develops afterwards. So let's look at the risk factors or factors that predisposes individuals to the development of pyloric stenosis. So they include the sex. Pyloric stenosis is seen more often in boys, especially firstborn children than in girls. Now what's happening is mostly when you have conditions like these, a lot of research is done about it, on it. And this research will show certain patterns. Sometimes it is not known why it is like that. Let me take another example like the current pandemic that we are experiencing. Uh, according to research, a lot of men are affected more than women. I'm talking about the coronavirus pandemic. A lot of men are affected more than women. For now, one is not able to tell exactly the reason why. So being a boy predisposes you to the development of pyloric stenosis than being a girl. So it is a risk factor to be a boy when it comes to pyloric stenosis. 
then race. Pyloric stenosis is more common in Caucasians of the Northern European ancestry and is less common in African Americans and are rare in Asians. So once you are Caucasian of the European descent, then you stand a very high chance of developing pyloric stenosis compared to others. Then premature birth. Pyloric stenosis is more common in babies born prematurely than in full-term babies. Then smoking during pregnancy. A mother who smokes and keeps smoking during pregnancy predisposes the unborn child to the development of pyloric stenosis in the future. Then family history or genetic predisposition. Research or studies have found that higher rates of this disorder among certain, is among certain families. Pyloric stenosis develops in about 20% of male dis descendants and 10% of female descendants of mothers who had a condition. So what we're trying to say is, okay, so let's say the mother had a condition. About 20% of the mother's boys are likely to, so let's say a mother had pyloric stenosis when he or she was a child, and then later on gave birth to say 10 children, five, ch five boys and five girls. So 20% of the boys stands a higher chance of developing pyloric stenosis, whereas about 10% of the girls stands a higher chance of developing pyloric stenosis. So that's what we are saying. Early antibiotic use. Babies given certain antibiotics in the first weeks of life also stands a very high chance of developing pyloric stenosis. Examples of these antibiotics include erythromycin to treat whooping cough, for example, have increased the risk of pyloric stenosis. In addition, babies who are born to mothers who took certain antibiotics in late pregnancy also may have an increased risk of pyloric stenosis in the future. Bottle feeding, another risk factor. Some studies suggest that, when we say studies, we're talking about research. So some research findings suggest that bottle feeding rather than breastfeeding can increase the risk of pyloric stenosis. Most people in these studies used formula rather than breast milk. So it isn't clear whether the increased risk is related to formula or the mechanism of the bottle feeding. So let's look at the clinical manifestations of pyloric stenosis. When your pylorus is stenosed or narrowed, what are the signs and symptoms you are likely to manifest? Signs of pyloric stenosis usually appear within three to five weeks after birth. Pyloric stenosis are rare or is rare in babies older than age three months. So a typical sign of pyloric stenosis is vomiting after feeding. The baby may vomit forcefully, ejecting away, we call it projectile vomiting. Vomiting might, might be mild at first and gradually become more severe as the pylorus opening narrows. The vomit may sometimes contain blood. So, you know, if the baby has eaten, taking in breast milk, but unfortunately, the pyrolysis is narrowed. So the content is not able to what? Move into the uh, intestines. It is in the stomach. So the more the baby feeds, the more bloated the stomach will become. And then it gets to a point that the stomach will be uh, overflowing and this will lead to vomiting and this type of vomiting is not just a normal vomiting it comes out projectally like it projects as if something is pushing it from out there and pumping it out so we call it projectile vomiting so when you see a child who start to vomit gradually and then the vomit becomes intensified and then projectile in nature a baby of say up to three months, then you should suspect 
that the child is having a congenital anomaly called pallor stenosis. Then there is persistent hunger. Babies who have pallor stenosis often want to eat soon after vomiting. So you see, you can imagine why. This baby is not getting the nutrients, you know. The nutrients will only get into the body, the blood, when it gets into the intestine. At the intestinal villi level, the villi absorbs the nutrients and then the child gets a lot of glucose in the blood. But now that the food is not able to get into the intestines and then it is vomited out, the child will actually eat, but the food comes out again. Eat and the food comes out again. So this child is not getting adequate nutrients. As a result of this, the child feels hungry anytime he vomits. There is dehydration. The baby or the child might cry without tears or become lethargic. You might find yourself changing fewer wet diapers or diapers that aren't as wet as you expect. So, the child becomes dehydrated simply because water, fluid, is actually absorbed at the intestinal level, especially at the large intestinal level. But unfortunately, the food and the water is not getting down there because of the stenosis at the pyloric level. So because of this, this child is not getting adequate fluid that is coming out of the breast milk that, uh, as is required. And these eventually lead the child to become dehydrated. Then there is stomach contractions. There is wave-like contractions that ripples across the upper abdomen soon after feeding, but before vomiting. Now, this is caused by stomach muscles trying to force food through the narrowed pylorus. So as the food enters into the stomach, and the stomach is trying to propel the food into the intestines, but unfortunately, the pylorus is narrowed. So the stomach keeps pushing, wave-like, it push and it come back and gather momentum and push so as you observe the abdominal cavity of the baby, you will see that there is this wave-like movement at the epigastric level, indicating that the stomach is doing everything possible to push the food across the narrow part of the pylorus into the intestines. Then there is changes in bowel movements. Since pyloric stenosis prevents food from reaching the intestines, babies with this condition might be constipated. So, food is not getting down there. So, what is there to be passed out as stool? So, the child will appear constipated because nothing is coming. Weight loss. Pyloric stenosis can keep a baby from gaining weight and usually causes weight loss. Yes, that baby, babies grow by nutrients that are absorbed from the food that they eat. And like I said, these nutrients are only absorbed at the, intest at the intestinal level. But unfortunately, the food, or majority of the nutrients are absorbed at the intestinal level. But unfortunately, the food is not getting across the pylorus because of the narrowed segment. So because of this, the baby is not getting adequate nutrients as required and they tend not to thrive or to lose weight. Diagnostic investigations. What are you going to do to confirm that this child is suffering from pyloric stenosis? The condition is usually diagnosed before the baby is six months old. Physical examination and history. So this may reveal signs of dehydration such as dry skin and mouth, less tearing when crying, and dry diapers as well as abdominal distension. There is a life shaped mass when feeling the upper abdomen, which is the abdominal pylorus. An ultrasound of the abdomen can also identify the anomaly. Barium x-ray reveals a swollen stomach 
and narrowed pylorus. Then blood tests. This often reveals an electrolyte imbalance in the body. So this is a typical picture of a narrowed pylorus. You can see it clearly here. You can see the esophagus up there and then the stomach. And then the pylorus, after which it enters into the intestines. But unfortunately, the pylorus segment is narrowed. So content from the stomach is not able to flow into the intestines. This is another example. You can see the picture. All right, so management of pyloric stenosis. Treatment of pyloric stenosis involves surgery to widen the pylorus. The surgery is called pyloromyotomy. Pyloromyotomy. If putting the infant to sleep for surgery is not safe, an endoscope with a tiny balloon at the end is used. The balloon is inflated to widen the pylorus. In infants who cannot have surgery, tube feeding or medicine to relax the pyrolus is also tried. This relaxes the pyrolus and allows the food to enter through into the intestines. So with pyromyotomy, the child and the parents will have to be, I'm talking about a surgery, for you to prepare them preoperatively, the child and the parents will have to go through all the five managerial steps or modalities or components. Physical preparation, psychological preparation, socioeconomic preparation, spiritual preparation, and then physiological preparation. And then after surgery, all the measures under post-operative management also holds. Complications. Pyloric stenosis can lead to failure to grow and develop. And we all know why. Dehydration. Frequent vomiting can cause dehydration and a mineral imbalance. Electrolytes help regulate many vital functions. Stomach irritation. Repeated vomiting can irritate the, the baby's stomach and may cause mild bleeding. Join this. Rarely, a substance secreted by the liver, that is the bilirubin, can build up, causing a yellowish discoloration of the skin and eyes. All right, so this brings us to the end of pyloric stenosis. So like I told you, all the general preoperative management holds, all the general postoperative management holds, because this one is a baby, you will need to involve the parents in every single step. Thank you very much for this aspect.